Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Name Block Deep Dive for Registries. My name is Pinky Brand, and I'll be presenting today along with my colleagues Rolf Larson, Michael Halverson, and Kevin Kopas. Uh, the webinar is meant to give registry operators that are interested in using Name Block a better understanding into our marketplace platform. This session will be recorded, and we will provide a link to all the attendees. Uh, while we are welcoming non-registry operators that may be logged in today, I do want to note that this session is intended primarily for registries. And with that said, we're planning to conduct additional webinars after the new year, including one specifically for resellers and others to country code stakeholder organizations and their members. During the next hour, Rolf and I will start off our deep dive explaining our solution, the business model for registries, and what an amazing opportunity this is. We will go over the block categories that we will offer and how all that ties into preventing DNS abuse. Then Michael will give us a deep dive into the technical aspects of the platform and a view into how all this technology translates into products that can be sold. Then Kevin will get into all of the technical integration, the policy and the launch schedule matters that will allow you to implement name block. And I'll give you a hint, it will be really super easy to have name block integrate with your registry so that registries can offer blocks for your extensions and open up a brand new revenue source for your registry. Last, the chat window is not enabled, however, we invite you to raise any questions uh, during in the Q&A window that will be managed by Kevin, and then we will plan to get to them during the Q&A session portion of today's session. So now let's get going, and I'll turn the microphone over to Rolf Larson. Rolf. Thank you, Pinky. Um, well, let's uh, just uh, get started and uh, talk about what domain blocking really is. Um, domains that are blocked um uh those uh, exist in in a list um uh, in a registry um system and this list behaves very similar to uh, other lists that a registry might maintain in their backend system such as premium names list and uh, uh, domain reserved list uh these uh this this is a mechanism that uh, any registry can implement in in their system um in the provisioning system and um and uh, these domains that are blocked, they are blocked for registration. Uh, a domain that is blocked, it does not affect uh, uh, domains that are already registered. So it mean, means that uh, if a domain exists in a block list and the domain is already registered, uh, this doesn't uh, affect the registered domain name. But if this uh, domain name that is registered uh, expires, uh, then uh, it will return um, uh, into the block list and not be able to be re-registered. Uh, and this is a similar way that uh, a domain name that exists in a premium names list, in a tiered price list, for example, for premium names, will also end up back into that tier or back into uh, the premium name uh, list if it's supposed to be re-registered. Uh, these names they do not resolve. Uh, they do not uh, uh, exist in the um, in the registry zone file, uh, and therefore they are not uh, uh, affected by ICANN fees, uh, and they're not counted in in the registry uh, dumps. Uh, so next, uh, please. Uh, um, so uh, we, we uh, have a vision for how we would like uh, domain name blocking to be uh, performed and uh, and uh, offered uh, we would like to uh, focus on um, on preventing abuse with with blocking uh, we, we have been many years uh, working with uh, with uh, uh, anti-abuse um, uh, management and uh, and uh, blocking is a very effective way to uh, to uh, prevent abuse from from happening in the first place. Uh, and this this is our main focus. We we are also focused to make sure that blocking is something that can be uh, adapted by uh, any size of brands, 
So currently, um, um, blocking is something that mostly big brands have been uh, have been uh, focusing on, and and uh, and uh, uh, smaller brands uh, have, have um, not have the same abilities to to uh, to engage with those uh, services. Uh, and we want to change that. We want to make sure that any registrar, uh, any type of registrar, can offer uh, blocking very easily in uh, in the service, uh, either by using um, uh, our portal for for maintaining blocking or using our API. Um, and uh, next place, yeah. So we we fit into this. Um, this industry by uh, you know, so going between the the registries and the registrars, uh, our our service will um, have a provisioning uh, uh, interface and an API towards the registries. Uh, we will also have an API and a portal uh, towards the registrars. So retail regist uh, registrars will typically use our API for provisioning of of uh, uh, blocking. While uh, the corporate registrars will uh, will use our portal to maintain blocking on behalf of their clients. Uh, in addition, we will also uh, interface with existing blocking services that uh, that we will uh, get uh, back into. So, with this, I would um, uh, would uh, turn the word over to um, Pinky. We will talk about our products, prices, the business model and the opportunity that lies there for the registries uh, today. Thank you very much, uh, Rol. Uh, the name block solution is going to offer multiple blocking uh, levels, uh, some of which will be available during the normal registrar checkout process, similar to an SL cert or website hosting. A registry will be able to choose your level of integration. Thus, you can decide which block categories that you will want to opt into. So one such block uh, product, as you see here on the screen, is our anti-abuse blocking. So that would be blocking a minimum of about 150 to a maximum of 300 domain name variants of the term. So this includes suffixes, uh, homoglyphs, common misspellings uh, generated by um, our variance algorithm. And I'll get more into detail on that shortly. Uh, the number of domains in the block uh, would be depending on the, on the term name. This is designed to be really completely frictionless. Um, there's no SMD file or verification uh, will be required for this particular type of block. This block is not, we're not blocking a label, but the variance of a label. And we believe that this will be a big selling opportunity for you and your registrars. Other more elaborate blocks will be offered as well, such as the exact match blocking, which is, you know, of course, blocking the domains that exactly match um, the term, um, and we will require an SMD file um, or other verification may be required for that. As far as wildcard blocking goes, you know, that's kind of the nuclear option. We're not going to offer that uh, initially, but we do plan to add it sometime after our initial launch. And we will be very selective um, about this particular block category and certainly require verification uh, for this option. As far as third-party blocking services go, we are working with third-party blocking services at present, such as the familiar DPML, um, to integrate that service into the name block platform. And this will expand the availability of the DPML blocks to a wider audience, but in particular, it will allow all registrars to connect via a single API to not only the DPML blocks, but also to other third-party blocks that we will offer um, with any other, and of course, on top of all the other extensions um, that wish to be on the name block um, platform and manage it all in one place. That's that's one of the really big, big advantages of, of using um, our system. So let me go to the next slide here. Uh, so as Rolf mentioned earlier, we wanna make the internet a better place by preventing abuse. And NameBlock will be using real-time data from IQ Global. So if you're not familiar with IQ, we currently scan over 200 million domains daily for abuse and service hundreds of extensions and leading registrars with our abuse scanning and management products and services. And we've been doing this for years. And we understand as well as registries and registrars that detecting and managing abuse after it happens 
is a cost center. So let's be frank about that. However, we believe the data that we will utilize from IQ combined with the name block service will help us all to prevent abuse before it can happen rather than having to manage it after it happens. So let me get it into a little bit of the secret sauce on our algorithms and how we plan to accomplish this. So what you see on the screen now describes how we will help prevent DNS abuse with our anti-abuse blocking product and generate revenue opportunities. It's easy to figure out an exact match block, but how do you go about figuring out which variants of a domain that you should block? And that's not immediately easy to grab out of thin air. So first off, if you haven't heard me say this before, we are not blocking a label or a registered domain name with the anti-abuse block. We are blocking the variants of that label. And as I mentioned, we are leveraging IQ Global's data. Thus, NameBlock will have access to one of the industry's largest repositories of abuse reports. And that is at 40 million right now abuse reports that we have collected. And that's growing by roughly about 40,000 new reports every day. And from that repository, we can extract patterns, patterns of which domains variants are most used frequently for phishing and malware, botnets and spam and scam. And we'll also be able to include, you know, trends and patterns from recent world events like COVID and uh, the, the Ukraine uh, situation and crypto, uh, for example. So by using this abuse intelligence and using our string similarity algorithms, if the domain is taken on other TLDs or if it's in a dictionary term or if there are other brands using the same term, that input into the filter in the funnel that you see on the screen, that could literally be thousands if not hundreds of thousands of potential variants. However, we can score each variant, enabling us to categorize and filter the block label variants and distill it down to a most likely candidate for abuse list. And that's one of the outputs. That's the domain block list. That's the 200 or so variants that you can sell. That's the anti-abuse blocking product. And there are roughly 200 variant strings that would normally never be registered except for by bad actors with the intent to engage in terrible activities, nefarious activities, harmful, to a legitimate rest, uh, registrant. We will also generate a valuable domains list that you see um, there, a list of available names that we believe should be considered for standard hand registration, for example. And we will also generate a list of taken domains that the registrant should consider monitoring, disputing, or acquiring. And the reason why we filter is to minimize the chance of blocking legit domains and thus not limiting the internet namespace and reducing the likelihood of, of blocking disputes. So let's go to the next slide. Um, here's a, a little bit about the revenue model. So the revenue model is, is simple for registries. Name block will split the revenue 50-50 with the registry for our blocking services, such as the abuse variance and exact match and, and add-ons. And this will be the case, especially for a single TLD block that we believe will be typically ordered through a retail registrar's um, registration or renewal purchase process flow, for example. Your share of that 50-50 split will be prorated if your extension is contained as part of a multi-block order from a registrar. And that pro rata share will vary based on our discounts to the wholesale price that are based on the number of extensions in the multi-block and the number of blocking years that are ordered, purchased. We believe this will be a typical case of blocks ordered by, by corporate registrars, for example. If you've executed an NDA with us, we'll soon be able to provide you with um, much greater detail on the pricing schedule, as well as our service agreement that will explain all of the pricing and the terms. The registrars that are connected to name block will be able to mark up as they see fit, and that will be the price that is displayed to the block registrant. So <clears throat> let's think about the revenue opportunity a bit more here. Think about your entire zone file size right now and what it would mean to your top line revenue if say five to 10% of your registrants added an abuse variant package to their domain registration or renewal. 
Think about that. The potential for many registry operators could be hundreds of thousands of dollars per year in found revenue, and many extensions could realize a lot more. And for the most part, and for those very few registrants that have the budget, current defensive registration strategies involve figuring out what character string variants should be registered defensively and then needing to spend thousands of dollars, if not tens of thousands of dollars for just one year of normal hand registration in one extension alone to effectively block the most likely abusive variants. Thus, the addressable market at the current standard registration price points is extraordinarily limited. There just aren't a lot of folks out there that have that kind of budget. But what if you could help an infinite number of registrants protect their primary names or registered um, name in your extension by blocking, say, a couple of hundred of the most likely abusive names, but at a tiny fraction of the cost, similar to add-ons, again, such as I mentioned earlier, SSL certs and email and hosting. All they would have to do is click to add the block in the purchase process flow at their chosen registrar with automatic renewal year after year. And that is one reason why we believe name block will monetize the blocking of variant strings that would normally never be registered except by bad actors with the intent to engage in nefarious activities, harmful to the legit re registrant. In other words, we're not taking revenue away from you or replacing it. We're offering a product that can provide you with revenue that you would otherwise not receive and from potentially an infinite number of customers. And we do not believe that this will impact your normal registration revenue. Furthermore, variants or other names that are blocked from registration via name block are not resolving in the DNS. They are effectively banned name strings and thus not subject to accumulating ICANN fees. Another plus, it will also be possible for multiple parties to order a block on the same term, which means the same blocks can be sold to multiple registrants. We believe that the retail costs will be extraordinarily compelling to registrants in a purchase process flow we believe that they will see the value immediately and that they will see the variants that are blocked as they will be automatically suggested and provided. They won't have to hunt this down or try to figure out what they should be doing. Thus, no decision-making by the registrant will be needed. Um, no SMD file, no verification needed, reducing the friction. We believe this will be a found revenue opportunity to you, again, and the registrars to block names that would normally never be registered except by those bad actors. And it provides a real and tangible benefit to end user registrants in the fight against DNS abuse. So now I'll turn the session over to my good colleague, Michael Halverson, who will give us a deep dive into the technical aspects of the name block platform and a view into how all this technology translates into products that can be sold. Michael. Thank you, Pinky. Um, so um, and what I would like to share with you is kind of like the, the platform infrastructure diagram to, to kind of like illustrate how name block resides between the registry and the registrar. Um, and I can also mention that the team that's building this platform has experience building registry um, and service uh, platforms as well as registrar platforms. So one of our main goals with building this platform is to make sure we do most of the heavy lifting uh, to off, uh, offload the, the registrar and the registries in offering this as a service. So if we are to follow the flow here from the block registrant to the block uh, reseller or the block registrar, uh, like previously mentioned, we will have a couple of ways to interface with the system. Um, we will have a web interface that you, you log in with a username and password, which is like a, a place where you could, you know, um, provision blocks or delete blocks, get reports and all of that. In addition, we will have a full-fledged API, um, a JSON API, which will be easy to implement and easy to use. And we envisage, you know, the option for using just the dashboard uh, or just the API or a combination of the two depending on uh, what preference the, the reseller has. Um, so the 
when it comes to the, the, the integration here uh, from the reseller or registrar side, um, the API is a modern JSON API, so it's it's well documented. It should be fairly easy to use. And depending on the reseller and their complexity with their provisioning platform, we could see that you know implementing uh, blocking could take as little as as a day to implement to a couple of day, days, depending on on the team and the complexity. But the API itself is that is as easy <laughs> as could be in that sense. And as mentioned in the platform itself, this is where we do kind of like all the variance generation, we do all the validation, all the checking and everything that's needed in order to produce a list of domains that should be blocked. Once that has gone through all the various processes, we will take upon it on ourselves to provision these blocks uh, on the registry platform. Um, some registry service pro providers uh, actually offer an API to add the block and to, to remove the block and so on. Obviously, we will utilize that. Um, but we know from experience that many registries also do not have an API, and we are acquainted with that. We, we For our other services, we are already connected to six or seven different backend providers already. And our philosophy is to make it super easy for the registry to do this. So uh, we could either deposit the list of uh, block labels that needs to be blocked, or the, the registry could pull that information from our API. We are super flexible in the sense of finding the easiest way to, to manage that. We have also in the system decided to modulate blocking uh, very similar to how domain registrations work. Um, we could have chosen to go in a totally different direction, more like a subscription maybe or something like that, but we saw that it was opportune to, to modulate it very similar. So meaning uh, a block will have a domain life cycle similar to uh, what the domain has. And there's many benefits uh, with this model, but also the industry knows this model very well. So a block will have a create, a block will have a renew, a delete, um, expiry date, and so on. And further drawing on the similarities as well, we have also decided that we will offer a, a DNS server. Um, the DNS is a technology made for looking up domain names with low latency. Um, the protocol is well known and is used by many. So you will have a DNS server that you could query a single domain name and it will reply if it's blocked or not. The use cases for this are several, but you could envisage um, a registrar wanting uh, a rapid response to if a domain is blocked or not to enrich a checkout process. It could be used for that and many other things. In addition, we also want to draw on technology used by the industry, like for example, a is an RDAP server. And, and the thinking with this is obviously not to expose any registrant data or GDPR sensitive information, but it's a way for the general public to, to look up the status of a block. Even though the DNS server will give you an answer if it's blocked or not, it doesn't say anything else. So that's where the RDAP server could give information like, for example, who's the, the, the block reseller or the block registrar and how do I contact them? When was this block created? When does it expire? What's the current status of it? And so on. So, <clears throat> um, so the thinking with the platform, again, is to make it as, as easy as possible for, uh, for both the registries and the registrars to, to connect to it. Um, I was thinking also to just quickly take you over to the portal. Um, and show you some of how the variants generate works. This is a obviously work in progress, but um, what it can will illustrate how the name variant spinner works. And we can take an example with Microsoft, for example. I will turn on the main status checker and run it with the generator. So this will not be. Uh, the user interface that's going to be used by, by uh, the block registrars. They are, it's going to be presented with a storefront and a checkout process, which is much more refined 
So this is more like a sandbox to test out the algorithms and see what they produce uh, of output and so on. So we could see from using Microsoft as an input, it generated um, several variants where it ended up with uh, roughly 270 variants within different um, uh, categories and, and, um, and algorithms that produce them. So we could just for fun, for example, let's say we want to sort by the ones that are already registered on .com. So if we set that as a filter, we can see of the variants generated from Microsoft, 176 is already registered. We sort that by algorithm again. We could look at, for example, the homoglyph variants. We see there's, for example, there's somebody who has registered uh, RN as an alternative to M in, in the name Microsoft, obviously not with legit intent. And there's many examples of this. And we can also do another one, for example, Walmart, generate the variance for that. Um, and see what that produces. So in that case, we've got 180 variants. The number of variants will be heavily influenced by the length of the string and various other um, uh, criteria for, for selecting it. And here also, I'm assuming there's a lot of, you know, homoglyph variants already registered. Uh, there's abuse affix variants, like, for example, HTTP, Walmart, uh, Let's see who's, uh, who has taken that, if any. So what I can see from this is that, yeah, that's being sent to Walmart. We could uh, do walmart.com. So, so it's pointing to, to someone else. So obviously it's been taken by somebody else to, to trick people that's going to walmart.com into believing they're go ending up at Walmart's. So walmartlogin.com, same thing. So yeah, just an example of how, how the spinners works and so on. Um, I think Pinky also mentioned the thing about how it could be embedded during uh, a retail registrar checkout process. And just to give some illustration of that, this is kind of like a cartoon drawing of, of a fictitious registrar where the registrant has gone in and it, they search for domain name, they get this typical domain spinner with the variant with the domains that they can register. And in this case, they have selected one of them and they can then be presented with, you know, by the anti-abuse protection for, for your domain. And, and just to reiterate, it's not the domain itself you're blocking, but it's these variants um, that we're talking about. So looking at the funnel, it's these domains that are very obviously not going to be used by uh, any other by legit intentions. It's basically the abusive ones. And they can just click add to shopping card and, and it gets processed. But as the terminal also show, you get the list of these valuable domain names. And that's just a consequence of the algorithm. It picks out and many good names as well that should be considered. And one way that registrars could utilize this list uh, is, for example, during a renewal inside the control panel, they could say, hey, look at these domains. You should consider registering them. Or in this example where they can send out an email after the fact the block was, was purchased, that they will get this list of super nice relevant domain names that is available for registration. So just a, just a simple example of that. So I think with that, I will turn over to you, Kevin, to continue. Fantastic. I just love seeing the actual variant generator showing examples. I think that that's such an illustrative, awesome way of showing how we're preventing DNS abuse. Thanks for that, Michael. Uh, policy and onboarding. Um, so some of this is going to be a little bit repetitive from what you've heard already, uh, but we kind of wanted to go through from a registry's perspective, what do you guys have to do to hook up? Uh, what is the technical status of some of the names? What access, what data access and all that kind of stuff. So um, first question, and I think Pinky and Michael and Rolf have made this really clear. Our overall goal with uh, the 
design implementation launch of NameBlock is to make it really, really simple for a registry to be like, yep, I want either my single extension registry, my couple extension registry, or my couple hundred extension registry to be able to hook up and offer uh, blocks to registrars, to end users, to resellers as simply as possible. So in that, um, in an effort to, to lock that down or to make that more clear, um, we're going to have an API that Michael has mentioned, uh, which is going to be pretty simple. Um, right now, I know we're hooked up to quite a few different backend providers. Some of them are going to let us into that band list via an API. Some of them are going to require we just deposit like a CSV file or some sort of other data file. Uh, but basically, once your registry says, yep, I want to onboard this, I want to offer name block to my registrars or two registrars, we're going to figure out how to implement that or hook up with the backend provider that that you use um, automatically. So that's kind of on us, but it's gonna be a very simple process. Uh, what is the technical status of block domain names? Um, they're technically banned. Um, this is really similar to, if you're a new domain registry, uh, you have an ICANN spec five list. Those are the names that are not allowed to be registered in any new domain extension. So I know that there's a bunch of like Red Cross names. There's a bunch of uh, names. I think that list is roughly like nine or 10,000 names um, for per extension um, that are not allowed to be registered and they're just banned. So if you do a who is look up on one of those names, it actually says banned or blocked by the registry. These names are going to fall into that same list. What that means is that they're not available for registration. They do not resolve. They cannot be used for any sort of DNS uh, usage. If someone goes to a registrar and does a search for one of those domain names, they actually show up as not available in that registrar's search results. So it's not like someone can try to scoop the name or, or register it or you know get it or if it expires or anything like that, it's actually on a banned list. Um, and then the coolest part or one of the cooler parts about this whole thing leading up to is, um, and I know this has been mentioned, but there's no ICANN fees. So as a registry, you're not paying that registry ICANN fee, and then the registrar is not paying that registrar ICANN fee. Um, and that's, again, because the name doesn't exist. It can't be used. It can't be, it doesn't resolve. It's just blocked. Um, and then lastly on this slide, um, what data does name block? What do we actually need to have access to? Um, this is an important question, obviously. There's a lot of sensitive promo data, um, pricing data, and all that stuff that a registry has. Um, the only thing name block actually needs is that API or that access to update your registry's ban list with your backend provider. So uh, I'll just use, uh, I know Central Nick, for example, has a really nice API that we can log into or we can uh, push names to that ban list. We can delete names from that ban list. So if someone doesn't renew one of their blocks, we can just send an API command in, say, hey, delete this name from the ban list. As soon as it's deleted, then that name or those series of names are available for registration. Uh, some backend providers are going to require that we, like I said, deposit some sort of data file, whether that's a CSV file or an Excel file or some other, um, you know, whatever, whatever that data needs to look like. Um, but that's all we need to do. So if we're just updating that file once a day or once an hour or per order, whatever that is, um, that's on us to connect to. But that's the only thing we need access to. Uh, we do not require access to any. Um, sensitive data like transactional data, promotional prices, if you guys are running promos or anything else that is used by the registry for day-to-day -day operations. So we're keeping it really simple. All we need is to be able to update that registry's ban list. Um, we are going to have the ability for a registry to say, hey, I don't want these names to be eligible to be blocked. So we've talked a little bit about that. If you have a premium name list or if you have just names that you don't want to be blocked for whatever reason, um, we're going to have the ability for a registry to upload that list or input that list into the system and say, hey, these names are not blockable. Um, so that could be your premium list, but we're not asking for the premium list. We're just saying, hey, put in whatever names are not going to be blockable so that if someone tries to apply a block, it'll say, hey, this name is going to throw out that algorithm is going to throw out and say, hey, this name is not available for block, but these other ones are. So next one, please, Pinky. Sure. Uh, more fun I can stuff. Um, what about an RCEP? Um, more than likely, your registry is going to have to file an RCEP if you would like to onboard NameBlock. Uh, it's a really simple RCEP. Uh, we actually already have a template ready to go. Once that template is submitted to ICANN, it's going to take roughly 30 to 45 days. Uh, if there are any ICANN-related questions, uh, we're all very versed in ICANN policy and working with ICANN. And um, we have not already submitted the RCEP template to ICANN, but ICANN has already taken a look at it and given us their sign-off that, hey, this looks good, there shouldn't be a problem. So we're not anticipating any issues there. Um, and then, like I said, if there are any questions, we're once we're all helping you onboard NameBlock, we're, we're going to be there to help any, any sort of ICANN uh, 
related questions that might come up. Um, and then the other exciting part, um, I know we have some country code extensions that are already that are on this call. Uh, we've had quite a few, quite a bit of interest from other country code extensions as well. Um, there's no RCEP for you guys. So that's a really fun, makes it easier to onboard uh, name block. There may be some uh, changes that are required in your terms and conditions for a domain registration. Uh, and that would be the same for a generic uh, country code, or I'm sorry, a generic domain extension, as well as a country code extension. Um, that's something, again, that we have already uh, worked on. We've already made some changes to other uh, extensions, terms and conditions. So we're very well versed in that. It's going to be a very simple process to make those changes. Uh, but those are the main policy side of uh, the issues that, that or things to, to think about. But we have all that ready to go for you. Next one, please. Uh, what's next? I love that. That's the name of my Jeep. So um, now, uh, what's going on right now? Uh, we're sign actively signing NDAs with registries and registrars. And also, we keep saying registries and registrars, but you don't have to be a registrar to sell this product. We also are working with end users like law firms, like IP law firms, anyone who has clients that need to help their brand be protected online or reduce DNS abuse for their, their customers or their clients' brands. Um, so we're signing NDAs with all three of those categories. Basically, what that gets you is the pricing communicated, uh, our documentation, our API docs, our terms and conditions, our contracts, things like that. That's what we're working through right now and then into January. Uh, sometime in mid to late January, we're expecting to have that sandbox access. So you can get your team in there. Your tech team can start figuring out how to hook up to the, if you're old, if a registry, I'm sorry, if a registrar is only going to be offering a retail product, they can figure out how to hook up to the API um, we're going to be working with backend providers in January so that the, uh, we're making sure that we have that API access to banned names or unbanned names, or if it is depositing the CSV file, whatever that is. So um, in January, we're also going to have the registrar webinar, which I think I would encourage if you're a registry, I would encourage you to join that one as well, because we, it is going to be a very deep dive registrar focused webinar, but it again might answer some questions that you might have uh, from the process or, hey, how do I work with my registrar partners to, to help them onboard main block, things like that. Uh, February, March-ish is when we're hoping that all, or we're expecting all of the technical integration to be happening, uh, depending, and Michael could, I think, spoke a little bit to this, uh, but depending on your tech team, it could be a very simple integration process, uh, could be a little bit longer of an integration process, but we're here to help. We're here to make this as simple and painless as, as possible. So really most of the integration from the registry perspective is us hooking up to the backend provider. So um, again, we're not really expecting that to be super, super difficult. Uh, and then March, 2023 is when we're expecting to launch a V1. Um, that's gonna include that anti-abuse variant generator uh, retail product. Uh, we're hoping to have quite a few uh, extensions on board and make this a, a mass market product to reduce DNS abuse and help brands help brands stay safe online. Awesome. Slide, please. I think this is the or final. Perhaps just to, to, to add, uh, add to this, um, this slide um, uh, that uh, we will, of course, be uh, on an ongoing basis at the registries to the platform. And, and uh, that time frame uh, that was shown is, uh, is if you want to be a part of the launch. And then it follows that time frame, but uh, but otherwise uh, it will be a sort of an open uh, open book for for uh, uh, adding your registry to the uh, to the platform uh, after yeah. that as well. Absolutely, I should have should have said something like that. Yeah, so it's going to be obviously a rolling onboarding process. Everyone's going to have a different ICANN RCEP time frame. Everyone's going to make different decisions at a different timeline. So we're going to be continuously adding new extensions to the platform as as things go move forward. Yeah, and, and what, one more thing I wanted to add is that. Uh, we, as you saw, we, we have several different products. Um, uh, obviously, I have this um, this main uh, product that uh, blocks uh, variants of uh, of a label. Uh, but every one of our products, you are you can either opt in or opt out of as a registry. So you you, you can either opt into all of them or you can opt out of some of them. So that's uh, that's up to the registry to to decide. Yep, and that's all going to be available in your registry control panel. Um, I think yeah. Rolf, that's a very good point. Um, if you don't want to offer the wild card or if you don't want to offer a different product, um, again, if you want to have a list of names that cannot be blocked, all of that functionality is going to be built in there. Um, it's really meant to be as simple and open as possible for the registries to manage how you want to work with name block and then also for registrars to manage how they want to work with name block. Yeah. So you, uh, it, we, oh, we go got ahead. Some questions. I was going to say we've got some questions rolling in. Uh, 
I thought I would uh, just go through those um, and then we can address them. Uh, the first question was, uh, once variants are blocked, would the domain registrant be able to unblock a specific variant if they wanted to register this themselves? And um, I would <laughs> basically, uh, a name can be unblocked. So uh, when you unblock the name, it becomes available for registration and then the registration would be normal registration revenue. Uh, second question is identity digital, um, formerly known as donuts are doing something similar to the anti-abuse blocking, I believe. Is, are you working with them? Um, yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the uh, in this session, uh, we plan on uh, inviting and, and offering all third party blocking services. We want to be inclusive uh, and we want to provide a single marketplace. So to that, in fact, uh, yes, uh, is the answer to that question. We, we certainly are speaking with uh, Identity Digital. Uh, the next question is, if registrars are slow to sign up, is there a way for a registry to still provide this? Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> talking about registrars, there are two different uh, categories. And, and one, one category is uh, corporate registrars will uh, uh, have a, sort of a, a faster route to onboarding because they have um, uh, not much to do. They can they can uh, uh, log into our portal and, and start to do business uh, immediately. Um, uh, but retail registrars, they will have to do something if if they want to use our API. And and uh, we do uh, anticipate that uh, that uh, retail registrars will have a longer route to onboarding and you know the bigger the registrar is probably the more time it takes uh so uh for that reason we we do believe that we have more, you know more corporate registrars in the beginning than retail registrars but this will level out over time thanks rolf um next question uh for other blocks um for example an exact match who does the verification does the registry do this yeah. or do you meaning name block Michael, you want to take that one? Yeah, so we will do the verification of uh, of the SMB file. So that will be um, part of uh, our workflow. Thanks, Michael. Um, another question is, do I need to sign any agreement uh, before I can get started? Uh, well, the answer to that is uh, you would need to sign our NDA uh, and you can do that simply by going to the name block, um, our name block site at nameblock.com. Uh, to get that process going. And that way we'll be able to share uh, much more detail with you, the pricing and uh, the terms and conditions and, and all that, that sort of thing. But um, certainly you can contact us. We're happy to talk to anyone anytime and you know be able to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, any other questions? Let's see. Um, oh yeah, can we test um, yeah, can we test our connection prior to the launch? Um, Michael, you want to take that one? Yeah, um, as soon as the APIs are are ready, you will be able to experiment and use the Sandbox um, API to do um, to do to do test onboarding. So, so definitely. Thanks. Um, next question is: um, Will a block name have to pay a, an ICANN fee? So, uh, perhaps you may have not been um, logged in earlier. Uh, in this session, but um, that's one of the uh, one uh, a key benefit is is that because the names are not resolving the DNS, they are effectively on a banned list. Um, the names are not resolving; they are not uh, subject to any um, ICANN uh, fee. So um, that's the answer to that one. Kevin, any other questions? I don't think so. The only thing I wanted to clarify a little bit was uh, there was the question about can I unblock a certain one, um, and that's something that comes up quite a bit. Um, and like Rolf said, yes, you can unblock one of the domains that is blocked, and you can use it. And you can also that means you can also keep all of the other ones still blocked. So if you did block uh, the abuse variant and it was MicrosoftLogin.com, and Microsoft wanted to actually use that, they could say, hey, I know this is an abuse variant, but we want to unblock that one and keep everything else blocked. So um, that's that's just a, just to elaborate a little bit on that. I think that um, that comes up a lot in our registrar, um, sorry, registry and registrar meetings for that matter. But uh, yeah, no, I think that's 
that's pretty much it. I don't think is anyone else having. Oh, we got there, one, there was one more, more question just popped up. Is there a fee for this for a registry? I'm not understanding if that means for this means for unblocking or uh, a fee. Yeah, I, the name I, service. I can take that one. So there is going to be a fee. We're going to charge the end user or the registrar a fee because there is a process that we have to go through as name block to unblock that name. However, once the name gets unblocked, then you will be getting the registration fee. So we're not charging the registry any money for that uh, service. We're going to charge the registrar, the registrant, an unblocking fee for that domain. And then they will be registering the domain name, presumably at that registrar. And then you would be getting the registration fee and renewal fee and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and there's no no uh, fees to uh, for the registry uh, to to get on board on this service. So there's no there's no setup fees, no sign up fee. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so if you uh, if you have some, I don't think there are any other questions. Uh, if not, um, we will be posting and updating our site with uh, frequently asked questions at nameblock.com. So you can always go there. And again, you can always contact any of us. Um, we'll be more than happy to to talk to you. Um, subscribe to our newsletter. You know, like it says on the screen. You know, follow us on social media. Uh, but uh, We'd love to get engaged with you, and we're we're really happy and proud that so many um, have already um, asked to engage with us and are interested. So we will be uh, this particular session is being recorded, and we will make it available to you and to those that were not able to attend today, so that you may view it later at your convenience. Uh, you can also register for the registrar specific webinar that will be next January, and we'll be announcing that that soon. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Thanks to Michael and Rolf and Kevin, and thank you audience for your time and attention attending today.